Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair. Last month, Star Trek Discovery premiered, and while I wasn't completely sold on it at first, right now, as the series has released at the time of this video's release, seven episodes, I am loving it. It's fucking cool. And if you have a problem with Starfleet officers using profanity only in this series, I'd like to raise you Data said oh shit in Generations, and Archer and Trip said son of a bitch a whole lot on Enterprise, and no one decided that that was what made them uncomfortable about those iterations of the show. But I'm getting off topic. As with every Star Trek series, naturally, we're going to be getting some tie-in novels written about the characters in the universe of the show. And they got a veteran Trek novel writer to do the honors of starting it off, David Mack, who has written Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, Starfleet Corps of Engineers, along with his own acclaimed book series, Star Trek Vanguard. As the first Star Trek disco, and no, I won't stop calling it that book, it has a lot to accomplish. It has to not only be a good Star Trek book, but it has to nail down the characters that the show itself hasn't even completely nailed down yet, which is a daunting enough task in and of itself. But this one had it even worse. Most other Trek shows released novelizations first, and then original novels came later, at least a few months after the show started airing. But the same damn week? That's crazy! Especially when you think about how scripts can change late in production, so you better hope that the characters stay the same throughout production, right? David Mack had a pretty astronomical task in front of him. And then Brian Fuller went and requested that this also be a crossover with Pike's Enterprise, which you would think would be a good thing because established crew and all, except that aside from Spock, canonically we don't really know anything about any of Pike's crew outside of their one official episode. Anyway, as with all Trek books, this one is non-canonical, but maybe it can answer some of the questions that we all still have about Discovery and its place in the Trek timeline. Let's boldly go into what truly is where no one has gone before, with Star Trek Discovery Desperate Hours. Oh, not again. It's a glorified photo cover. It's a publicity shot of Michael Burnham, as played by Sonequa Martin-Green, in her uniform, standing half-turned around, holding a phaser and facing the camera, in front of the Starfleet Delta symbol on a light bluish background. Oh, and on the subject of the uniforms, I didn't like them at first, mainly because I super dig the uniforms from the original Star Trek pilot episodes. But they've kind of grown on me. They're not my favorites, but I don't hate them. We've got the series logo in the TOS font in the middle, which is a bit of a misnomer. Now, while the name of the series is Star Trek Discovery, if you've walked past the first two episodes, you know that the USS Discovery itself doesn't actually show up until the third episode. My point is that since this takes place before the start of the series, the USS Discovery doesn't show up at all in the book, so shouldn't this be called Star Trek Shenzhou? And underneath, we've got Desperate Hours in the same font. The top of the cover also tells us that this is an all-original novel based on the explosive new series on CBS All Access. I hate that I broke down and bought a subscription for that, by the way. It was a hell of a first episode, though. 
The cover is garbage, and it's everything I hate about Star Trek book covers. It's not the worst one ever, and I get that they didn't have a lot to go off of considering this was released side by side with the show, but still. Space background, shot of the ship, it's not that hard. Or commission an actual artist to do an illustration. Where did the days of the oil paintings go? It just feels lazy when this should rightfully be a triumphant occasion for pocket books. The first book based on a new Star Trek property in over a decade. Anyway, let's get to the story itself. Our story takes place exactly a year before the first episode of Discovery, starting us on the USS Shenzhou, where Captain Philippa Georgiou is holding a celebration for her first and second officers, who were being promoted and sent to a new ship. It's sad for the Shenzhou, but it means that Georgiou has to pick a new first officer to replace them. And her choice is her protege, Michael Burnham, a human raised on Vulcan by Ambassador Sarek following her parents' death. Yeah, I'm not too keen on Spock having yet another secret sibling, but I'll get into that later. What's important is that while Giorgio is happy to do it, her science officer, Lieutenant Saru, will likely not be happy about that, considering that he has seniority, but he also has issues relating to the crew, so Giorgio and Admiral Anderson both want Burnham for the position. Burnham isn't so sure about it, since she didn't attend the Academy, and she's only been in Starfleet for a short time at this point. But Giorgio tells her to try it out on a probationary basis. Meanwhile, on an outlying self-governing colony during a drilling operation, they hit something below the ocean bed, which causes major earthquakes and destroys the rig, while the few survivors flee to the hub city to meet with the governor. Governor Kalova doesn't buy it at first, but then a drone shows up and attacks the city. And they thought Amazon Key was bad. They can't defend against it, so the governor is willing to listen and sends out a distress call to Starfleet. Naturally, there's only one ship in range. The Enterprise. And the Shenzhou, who picks up the signal first and starts heading there. So Pike figures that they can continue their heading. Well, that was a great crossover. The Shenzhou arrives at the colony and destroys the drone, and they start doing their research, including figuring out that whatever they hit on the ocean floor that released the drone, nicknamed the Juggernaut, isn't indigenous to the planet. The Juggernaut turns out to be a ship which no one knew was under there. But, as Giorgio points out to Governor Kalova, that should have been discovered and reported to the Federation when the colony site was surveyed. The Shenzhou sends information about the colony back to Starfleet, and Admiral Anderson sends an urgent message to the USS Enterprise, telling Pike that he is to report to the colony and assist the Shenzhou, and if necessary, destroy the Juggernaut if it manages to get back to being spaceworthy, even if it means irradiating the entire colony below. Saru and Burnham investigate the Juggernaut on a survey mission, while the Juggernaut sends out more drones to attack the Shenzhou, ones even more powerful than the previous ones, as if they're adapting. Damn it, Archer, if this is the Borg, I just know that this is going to be related to your skirmish with them. Pike shows up, and he and Giorgio get into it over her desire for saving everyone, and Pike's desire to follow Starfleet regs. They can't come to a satisfactory solution, and almost get into a firefight. But Burnham takes initiative and sends a covert message to the science station of the USS Enterprise, hoping that their shared father figure is enough to convince Spock to help her cause. And it does, with Burnham and Spock being able to convince their captains to allow them to go down and investigate the Juggernaut together, giving them a few hours to hopefully disarm or destroy it, so Pike doesn't have to take command of the sector and destroy the colony. Not to mention the fact that Governor Kalova takes the Enterprises and Shenzhou's rescue teams hostage, since the entire governing body is on the hook for falsifying the survey data, so they have to handle that, all the while the drones are still coming at them. Spock and Burnham get into the Juggernaut, which dampens signals going in and out, so they're on their own without any help from Enterprise or Shenzhou. They go through trials that seem to be testing them and their ability to perform teamwork, while Saru and Number One, her name being given as Una, go down to the planet to look around the area where the Juggernaut is to see if they can find any clues as to where it came from or who created it in the effort of stopping it. 
Pike and Giorgio wait intently as the clock ticks away. Burnham and Spock eventually figure out that the ship has trials designed for two people to perform, and they do them admirably, working rather well together, likely due to the fact that they are both of shared heritage, having grown up with similar issues, Spock being a half-breed and Burnham being a human raised in a foreign land. Saru and Una find some cave drawings that depict the Juggernaut showing up to whoever lived on the planet previously. Upon analysis, they find out that the Juggernaut was sent out by a long-dead civilization, the Tyrannian Hegemony, to test civilizations using trials and then forcibly induct them into their vast empire. Ever notice how many hegemonies Star Trek have? The Gorn has one, the Kavin from last month had one. You'd think that there'd be more variety in evil-conquering societies. Burnham and Spock continue on, but they get to a section that requires them to split up and be unable to confer with each other to figure out the puzzle. Spock figures that there's one way he can use to stay tenuously linked to Burnham. A mind meld. She agrees after consideration, and he does so. They share their most painful memories, Spock's Kaswan ritual, Burnham's final memory of her parents, the night before the attack on the colony where they stayed behind so that Burnham could see a supernova the next day, Spock's memory of fighting another boy and knowing that Sarek would be disappointed in him, Burnham's memory of joining the school and knowing that she'll never belong, and finally, Spock experiences the memory of Burnham's death during a bombing on Vulcan where Sarek mind-melded with her in order to bring her back to life, something that Spock hasn't and will never experience, mind-melding with his father, only ever doing it through proxies like Burnham and Picard. They get through the next room and get to the end, where the ship asks them to swear their undying allegiance to the Turanian hegemony, which obviously they refuse, and so the Juggernaut begins attacking the two starships. They're holding back since Spock and Burnham are on board, but Spock and Burnham manage to blast a hole in the dampening field and get their distress call out so that they're able to be beamed out, giving the Enterprise and Shenzhou the ability to blast the Juggernaut out of the sky. Once that's done, the Enterprise and Shenzhou manage to stop the hostage situation once they can focus on it wholly, and everything turns out fine. The colony is done, but most of the citizens will be able to remain once a non-corrupt governing body comes in. Spock even learned a little about his parents, deciding that he truly is a Vulcan, likely a reference to Spock's emotional change between the two pilots. And Burnham is instated as first officer on a permanent basis because of her subterfuge with Spock. With the novel ending with Burnham lamenting that Saru is not going to be happy about that development. It would be most logical to stay tuned after these messages. And we're back. You made a most logical choice. Based on the scant stuff we know about all the established characters, everyone acts about the way you'd assume. Giorgio is exactly how she was in Discovery, same with Burnham and Saru, though we learn about their backstories as well, so we're a little more informed about their characters than we are from just the show alone. It also gives us a little more backstory into what they're trying to do with Spock and Burnham, which seems to be that Sarek wanted Burnham to be purely human because she is human, and that's what she has to be, whereas Spock, because he has Vulcan blood, Sarek wanted him to be purely Vulcan. Now, the episode Lathe gives us more backstory on that, but since that episode is fairly new, I won't spoil it here. Suffice it to say, though, I don't think that my surmission about Sarek's desires for his children is that far off than what the show wants. What's unique about this is that we get to learn about the various The Cage characters in conjunction with the Discovery characters to inform on them, which I think is an inspired choice because it allows us to learn about the characters through characters we know slightly better. Right now, the Shenzhou crew are a complete mystery, while Pike's crews are people that we know. Even though it's not the one that we followed for three seasons and six movies, the archetypes were all there from the beginning, and the three that we know the most about, Pike, Number One, and Spock, are the ones that inform on the main three Discovery characters. Obviously, Spock and Burnham were going to be paired because... Duh. And I do like that, despite my displeasure that we're adding more backstory onto Spock's life on Vulcan that honestly feels unnecessary, they at least seem to be using it to enhance both Burnham and Spock. 
In this, it does that well with their flashbacks of memories where they experience each other's darkest days. And, and this really made me love it. I think this might be the first book to ever acknowledge the canonicity of an animated series episode, since it mentions Spock's trip to the wilderness where Akshaya was killed while his cousin rescued him as depicted in the animated series episode yesteryear. It's a small thing, but that endeared their relationship to me, knowing that Spock did indeed have that experience to share. And in doing so, it evolved Spock into the form he was in when Kirk took command. Was it a little ham-fisted for them to explain that here? A little bit. But it's more for the book's benefit to link it to an established plot point to ground the book in the Trek universe. I also liked how both Burnham and Spock have the same sort of logical thinking method, so when the Juggernaut's computer demands that they surrender to a dead civilization, they both point out the logical fallacy in that. We get to see Pike and Giorgio going up against each other, where Giorgio is more willing to find a diplomatic solution, while Pike, who I remind you, is coming off of not only the Talos 4 incident, but also the Rigel 7 incident, which almost made him quit Starfleet. So the fact that he's adhering strictly to regulations for the sake of the greater good is very fitting with that. What's one colony for the lives of the entire Federation? He's not glad to let sentient beings die, but if that's what it takes to destroy the monster, sometimes you, and in Pike's case, it's a lot more than sometimes, have to think of the needs of the many. So that's where Spock learned that from. On the flip side, we also learn about Giorgio in a way that basically affirms what we learned about her in Discovery. She's a seasoned Starfleet vet who believes in her officers and their ability to solve things diplomatically. For Saru, we get a lot of backstory on him and his people, the Kelpians, in conjunction with Number One, who finally gets a name. I admit I'm not too keen on that, but it's not like Mac came up with it on his own. It was apparently used a few years back in a different book, so I can't really fault it here. I just don't like the name. We do learn a lot about her, though, like her species, the Illyrians, and how she relates with her crew, just like Saru struggles with, not only on the Shenzhou, but also later on the Discovery. It's adding in a very good backstory element for number one, and I like it, especially considering that the last time we got any sort of nod to one of Maisel Barrett's characters, it was that bit from Carol Marcus from Into Darkness that turned Nurse Chapel into one of Kirk's many conquests. Saru is the most alien alien I think that we've ever had as a main character on Star Trek. Even the alien aliens like Neelix or Quark were extremely human in their personalities. But Saru, he's alien. He doesn't think like a human, he thinks like a Kelpian. And I really like that because it sets him apart from his shipmates. Honestly, as much as I really like Burnham, Lorca, and especially Tilly, Saru is quickly becoming one of my favorite characters. I admit, I'm a little annoyed that we don't get to see much of Dr. Boyce, though I do have another Pike-era book that covers him as a secondary protagonist, so I guess it's fine. What annoys me is that we don't really know the Shenzhou's chief medical officer, so they couldn't really meet, since the Doctor role on the show is taken by the Discovery's chief medical officer, and really only Giorgio, Saru, and Burnham cross over onto the rest of the show. I do like how we got some backstory for all the random Shenzhou crew who were likely never going to appear again following the switch to the Discovery. The characterizations for Pike's Enterprise crew are spot on as far as their personalities in their only episode go. David Mack has a great handle on all the characters in this book, and considering the dauntingness of that task that I touched on at the start of the video, that is quite an accomplishment. If I had one real complaint, it would be that this takes place too early, because we don't get to see all the characters that I've come to love over these past seven episodes, like Lorca, Stamets, and of course, the greatest Star Trek character ever, Cadet Sylvia Tilly. Yeah, no, seriously, she's my favorite character so far. 
it's Star Trek, which is honestly the best praise I can give to the action in this. It reads like a Star Trek episode. But what's interesting is that it doesn't read like a Discovery episode or an original series episode. It reads like its own thing, but it is an undeniably Star Trek. And it does a really good job of keeping suspense, even though, due to the nature of the book, we know that the major players survive, especially the parts where Burnham and Spock were in mortal danger. It never lost its sense of suspense, even though Spock lives two lifetimes and Burnham is most definitely still alive a year later. I also want to give props to this book for not giving us a shock death of Jose Tyler or Dr. Boyce or Number One, people who could have conceivably not survived past this since they never appeared or were referenced again, aside from in reference to Talos IV. Like Pike, we know he survived. Same with Spock, but we've never seen Tyler, Boyce, or Number One again. I was still invested in a way that I wasn't really with other mid quill type stuff, like Agent Carter. We know Howard, Jarvis, and Peggy survive, so where's the suspense? This doesn't have that problem at all, and probably because the threat of death in Star Trek, especially in Discovery, which I think is trying to go for beating Enterprise's death toll record so far, is a legitimate threat. I also liked how we got four separate arcs for the book. We get the arc of Giorgio and Pike's differing values, Burnham and Spock coming to terms with Sarek's actions during their childhood, Saru and Number One getting to know each other, and the Governor's escape from justice, which thankfully ends with her getting her ass caught. The book flows very nicely. Nothing feels rushed or like it needed more. Everything feels exactly as long as it needs to be, and it keeps in the tone of discovery, even though the tone hadn't been set yet. They're not at war with the Klingons yet, but the book has the same dilemmas in it, especially with Giorgio and Pike's arguments over procedure. It's also very visual in a way that's striking. Obviously, I can imagine the Shenzhou's bridge or the Enterprise's bridge since I've seen them on the screen. But the fact that the writing in the book managed to make me really visualize the colony and the caves and the juggernaut, which I felt was like an organic Geiger-esque looking ship. I don't know if anyone else felt that way. But I could see it as if it was a televised episode. Some Trek books are so ambitious with their stuff that it's hard to imagine it on the screen, but this was different. I could see Pike's hologram on the Shenzhou's bridge. I could see Burnham and Spock, though likely due to the similar production values, I kept picturing Quintos instead of Nimoy's, because my visualization of Nimoy's Spock is always his Star Trek II appearance, which doesn't mesh with Burnham. But I could definitely visualize Saru and Number One standing together. Mac also manages to completely sell me on Discovery's place in the timeline. The aesthetics being different than the TOS era are explained away by saying that the Shenzhou is an older ship, so they have holograms instead of view screens, but the Enterprise is the more advanced ship. Think about how the better something gets, the simpler it is. Shenzhou is a text screen, but Kirk can do all that from a single button. The holograms are cool, but a total subspace bandwidth hog, so they get phased out by the time Kirk takes command. And the uniform discrepancy is that the cage uniforms were introduced solely for the Constitution-class ships, because those were the cushy postings, and they got a less formal uniform. It's not entirely meshing, but hey, at least Mac came up with something plausible, instead of just trying to convince me that Pike's Enterprise really looked like the Discovery aesthetics. This book is brilliant. It's exactly what Discovery needed to start it off in the literary world. It's telling us a story about our characters and informing on them, despite the fact that they haven't given any character traits yet. I mean, chronologically, the characters aren't the ones that we'll eventually see on the show yet, since they have a full year of growth left, but we still get to see the type of people they are, and Mac managed to perfectly encapsulate them. Looking at it from the perspective of someone who's seen every Disco episode up to this point, this may just be the best Star Trek book I've ever read. Not on merit of it being a great story, which it is, but because it's the only one I've read where it manages to give us the characters without any benefit of referencing earlier material. And in a way, I really respect that. 
It's easy to put in subtle references, which obviously this has, to Pike's Enterprise era and earlier. But we can't put in any cheeky references to Discovery because it hasn't happened yet. And I think that makes this book even more amazing, because it managed to make me love it without having to remind me of stuff I like. If you're on the fence about Discovery and the first episode on TV didn't entice you or endear you to the characters, I highly recommend this book. It's probably not canon, but it might make you care about the characters a little more, enough to at least give the show a chance and a one-week free trial. And if you've watched the show and like it, or like me, love it, definitely give this a read. It's the crossover that we all really, really want, but naturally we can't get on screen because of actors getting old and passing away. Maybe the next one can be a crossover with the Farragut. And that was Star Trek Discovery Desperate Hours. Was it good? It's only logical that it would be. It's a smashing start to what I hope will be a great ongoing series, where we can see the stories that we'd love to watch but can't get on screen. Every Trek show had awesome books, and I'm happy that Discovery is no exception. Though maybe we can get better covers for the follow-ups, huh? Regardless, I loved this book, and I am optimistic that not only will this be one of the best Star Trek shows ever, but the supplementary material, be it books and that forthcoming comic series, are probably going to be really good too, because we've got a great world to tell stories in. I love the TV show, but as a reader, I also love to experience the show through prose books as well. I can't wait to see further adventures with Burnham and company, and hopefully the next book will have more Cadet Tilly in it. Ah, damn it. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of the literary layer, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. Oh, and if you want to be notified of new uploads, you can hit that bell icon. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. As for the topic of next week's review, the answer is elementary, my dear viewer. See you next time. Not to mention the fact that Governor Kolova takes the Enterprises in Shenzhou's research rescue. Maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. As for the topic of next week's review... Oh, fuck. I forgot the pipe. This is why you get all your props out before you start the video, kids. I admit, I'm a little annoyed that we don't get to see much of Dr. Boyce, though I do have another Pike-era book that covers him as the secondary protagonist. Secondary? So ruin number one, getting to know each other, and the governor's escape from justice, which thankfully ends with her get getting her ass caught.